Hey everyone, I'm Paul and this is my 1997 Toyota RAV4. At the moment, the registration's expired and this car is not legal to drive on the road because it failed the emissions test. In this video, I'll tell you what I know about emissions testing and I'll fix the car too. In Salt Lake City, Utah, every car that is more than six years old requires emissions testing every year. It says here, a malfunctioning vehicle can emit 100 times more pollution than if it were functioning properly. It sounds crazy, but it's actually true. I'll show you some measurements later in this video. Salt Lake City is located in a valley between two mountains that do a great job keeping all the pollution we create right here in town. There are over 1 million people driving cars around, refineries spewing smoke in the air nonstop, and other smokestacks with plenty of toxic chemicals coming out. They are completely justified in requiring emissions testing here. I went to the Jiffy Lube down the street from my house, January 2022, and paid $49 to get my car tested. The RAV4 passed the emissions test, and I paid another $77 for one year of vehicle registration. The total cost is $127 per year for my car to be street legal. That's not counting insurance. January 2023, it was time to renew my registration, so I went back to Jiffy Lube and they failed my RAV4. Wait, what? I was very surprised. You and I know I've been fixing my RAV4 this whole time, and it should be better than last year. I mean, look at all this stuff I fixed. Ball joints, CV axles and boots, and even a whole new exhaust and catalytic converter. My car has a new cylinder head, too. It should for sure pass emissions. Ironically, they passed my car before I fixed the cylinder head and it was blowing tons of white smoke out of the exhaust pipe. So it's fine to drive a pollution monster around, but now that I fixed my car, it's not okay? What the hell is going on here? Let's take a closer look at the paper they gave me. If you look at the middle of the page, my car passed all the tests. The check engine light is off, the evaporative emissions and EGR systems are fine, but the car failed the visual inspection because I tampered with the catalytic converter. That's a bit harsh. I would like to say I fixed the catalytic converter. I recently installed a whole new exhaust system and a brand new cat. Why are they tripping? My car should pass the test. This is the vehicle emissions label located under the hood. Here it says TWC in parentheses 2. That means my car should have two catalytic converters. Well, it only has one now, and that's why I failed emissions. If you watched all my RAV4 videos, you already know I had a lot of problems with my exhaust. 1996 and 1997 model year RAV4s have a big clunky cast iron cat attached to the exhaust manifold. Mine was completely clogged, and the original replacement cat had been discontinued for a long time. It was too expensive anyway. I had trouble finding an aftermarket one that fit right, and I modified a Camry manifold and made it work. It wasn't very good though, and I kept breaking the flex pipe under the engine too. What a mess. The flex pipe breaks because the engine mounts are too soft, the engine rocks back and forth too much, and the pipe isn't very strong. In 1998, Toyota updated the engine on the RAV4 and it got a new exhaust system. They eliminated the clunky cast iron cat in front of the engine, and the stupid flex pipe that breaks easily. You get just one cat under the car. I got the original parts from the junkyard, then installed a brand new aftermarket catalytic converter under the car. I even rewired the downstream oxygen sensor to be a heated sensor because I was concerned it wouldn't work right being that far from the engine. I did all this work to keep the emission system working, so I was a bit shocked when I failed the test. Well, I'm not installing that clunky cast iron thing on the front of my car just for the damn test. I could register the car in another state where they don't do emissions testing, or maybe I can cheat a bit. I asked Jiffy Lube how they knew I needed two cats, and they told me about the sticker. So I removed the sticker from under my hood and took my car to a different shop. I stood there quietly, hoping they wouldn't notice my catalytic converter situation. The guy took a look at his computer and then went directly to looking under my car. Turns out, the first guy had left notes in some government website saying I had tampered with my exhaust. This shop also told me I need a second catalytic converter. I said, my car runs great. It has a new cylinder head and a new catalytic converter. Can't you just test it with the exhaust gas analyzer? He said they do that for pre-OBD2 cars, 1995 and older, and they won't do that for me because 
bureaucracy. I left with another piece of paper saying I failed. I still don't want the clunky catalytic converter and manifold, and I need to register my car. Maybe a small independent shop will just pass my car. I tried a third place and didn't pass, but I got lucky and the guy there was cool and explained everything to me. Back in the 1900s, the United States government realized cars polluted the air more than horses do, and the Environmental Protection Agency was created in 1970. Richard Nixon was the president of the U.S. at the time. The EPA wasn't just about cars. They focused on protecting water supplies from contamination, made laws about transporting oil on the ocean, and created national air quality standards. One of their first moves was taxing lead additives in gasoline. Things moved slowly, of course, so leaded gas wasn't actually banned until 1996. Until then, you would breathe in lead just by being outside. One study shows people born in the U.S. in the 1960s and 1970s have an IQ score 6 to 7 points lower because of lead in their blood. In the 1980s and 1990s, it was a bit lower, around 2.6 points on average. Breathing in tetraethyl lead is poisonous and makes you dumb. Today, we're still dusted with lead by small aircraft, but at least cars don't do it anymore. Lead wasn't the only problem. In 1970, the U.S. Congress adopted the Clean Air Act along with the creation of the EPA, and regulations were made about how much carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and hydrocarbons come out of a car. The automobile industry started installing the first-generation catalytic converters in cars in 1975. Leaded gas would clog a catalytic converter, so new cars required unleaded gasoline. Of course, all those older cars were still on the road, and there was plenty of leaded gas being used. In 1981, cars had three-way catalytic converters, and manufacturers slowly started adding emissions contraptions to their engines. Perhaps you've worked on a car from the 1980s with a million vacuum hoses in the engine bay and random extra wires connected to the carburetor. Carburetors had electronic chokes that would set the choke at the right position so you didn't pollute by pulling the knob to the wrong place. A belt-driven air pump would blow fresh air into the catalytic converter to make it work better. An EGR valve would bring exhaust air back into the intake to reduce oxides of nitrogen emissions. A charcoal canister was installed to catch fuel vapors coming out of the gas tank. Vapors from the crankcase were routed back to the air intake. Also in the 1980s, you would see the first fuel injection systems. The best system was multi-port fuel injection, where each cylinder would get its own fuel injector. The car has sensors like intake air temperature, crank position, cam position, manifold absolute pressure, and oxygen sensors. The computer can calculate how much fuel the engine needs in order for it to burn clean, and it would double check its work using the oxygen sensors. If there was too much unburnt fuel still in the exhaust pipe, the computer would trim the amount of fuel down to correct it. Finally, cars had the right equipment to control their own emissions. The first inspection and maintenance programs were established in 1983 in high-pollution areas like big cities in California. Cars were required to pass emissions tests in order to legally drive on the road. In 1990, Congress required further reductions in hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, oxides of nitrogen, and particulate matter emissions in cars. Car manufacturers had to make their engines better, so by 1991, almost every car had fuel injection and the first onboard diagnostic system, OBD-1. OBD-1 can be found in cars from 1991 to 1995 before OBD-2 became the standard. If you have a 1994 or 1995 RAV4, you have the OBD-1 system. If your check engine light is on, you can read the codes by jumping the TE1 to the E1 terminal in the diagnostic connector by the alternator, and the car will flash the check engine light at you, kind of like Morse code. Check it out. My RAV4 is a 1997 model year with OBD2, but I still have the diagnostic connector in the engine bay. It's the black connector above the alternator. First, let's create a problem. I unplugged my intake air temperature sensor. When you turn the key to the on position, the check engine light will be on, showing you the light works. With the engine running, the light stays on if there is a problem. If the light is on, there is also a code stored in the car's computer. Turn off the engine. If you have a 1994 or 1995 RAV4 with OBD1, jumper the TE1 to the E1 terminal. Turn the key on, engine off. The light flashes, two short flashes, pause, four short flashes. 
one, two, one, two, three, four. That's code 24. I found the procedure and the list of codes here at troublecodes.net. 24 is the intake air temperature sensor. The last video clip you watched with the check engine light flashing was fake. I made it to simulate what OBD1 does. My car does not flash the check engine light to show you codes because it has OBD2. To read the codes on 1996 and newer cars, plug a scan tool into the OBD2 connector down by the gas pedal. Turn the key to the run position. You don't need to start the engine to read codes. The scan tool says I have code P0110 for the intake air temperature sensor. You can also view live data from the sensors while the engine is running. I started the car and I'm scrolling down to the air temperature sensor. It says negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If that was the temperature in my garage, I would need to wear a lot more than just a lab coat. It's the lowest value because the sensor is disconnected. Let's plug it back in. With the key on, engine off, I'm erasing the trouble codes. Now when I start the car, the light stays off because the computer didn't find a problem with any sensors this time. The scan tool I'm using is the eDiag YA-201. It can read and clear OBD2 codes and can display live sensor data. It's all you need to diagnose a check engine light in your car. Why did I go on a tangent and tell you all this stuff? Well, it's because I'm a YouTuber and wasting your time is what we do. Just kidding. It's so the rest of the story makes more sense. Getting codes from an OBD1 vehicle is different for every manufacturer and it's annoying. Cars 1995 and older get the exhaust gas analyzer test where they measure what's coming out of the exhaust pipe. Cars 1996 and newer have OBD2. And it's great because the same scan tool works on every car. The government just trusts that the manufacturer designed the emissions control systems correctly. When you get your car tested, the shop inspects the emissions components to make sure they are present. Then they connect a scan tool and ask the car's computer if everything is okay. They don't actually measure the emissions using the exhaust gas analyzer. Let's run through the test. First, they look for the emissions label under the hood. It's missing. They can't be fooled that easily because they have a book. Next, they inspect the exhaust under the car. There is a catalytic converter. Good. The second one is located under the hood. That pipe looks a little skinny. Looking from under the car, you can see the front cat is missing. The government wants pictures of two catalytic converters. This car can't pass. Turn the key on. The check engine light works. Start the engine and the light is off. That's good. Now connect the OBD2 scan tool. Read codes, and there are no stored codes. Also, no pending codes. That's good. Now you might be thinking, I'll just clear the trouble codes in the parking lot with my $25 scan tool and I'll pass my emissions. It's not that simple. When you start the engine, the computer immediately tests most of the sensors for continuity, but some things can't be tested until you drive the car. The catalytic converter and oxygen sensors don't work until they warm up. The evaporative emission system that stores gasoline fumes from the tank will open a valve and vent stored fumes into the engine when cruising on the highway. The EGR system also works mostly on the highway. The car has to go through a few drive cycles to test all the systems. My scan tool has an inspection maintenance readiness feature that lets you know if those tests were done by the computer. The emissions shop will also check this, and if the tests weren't done by the car, you won't pass and they'll tell you to come back after driving the car a bit. One exception to that rule is the EVAP monitor. I just cleared the codes in my car after showing you the OBD2 stuff, so I needed to drive the car for the computer to test everything again. After 5 miles of highway driving, the computer completed all the tests except EVAP. I asked Google what conditions need to be met to run the EVAP monitor and got 10 different answers. Nobody knows when cars test the evaporative emission system. I went on three different drives including highway and street driving and my car did not test the EVAP system. The emission shop will take the gas cap off the car and pressure test it and you'll pass the inspection if everything else is okay. In typical YouTuber fashion, it's been 15 minutes, I will now get to the point.
I just need to add a second catalytic converter to my car. Use a 14 millimeter socket to remove the two bolts from the front of the exhaust pipe here. The gasket is a Felpro 23626. It's about $4. If you're feeling rich, you can buy the Toyota gasket for $15. The Toyota gasket is slightly smaller and fits better, but they both work just fine. Pro tip, support the back part of the exhaust with a jack stand. I built a jig out of wood to hold the exhaust pipe in the right position while I modify it. Here I bought the world's cheapest catalytic converter, just $45 on Amazon. There are numbers and letters engraved on the side saying it's a catalytic converter, and there's stuff inside too. Is there any platinum and palladium in here? Who knows? Probably not. My check engine light is off currently, so it doesn't matter if this cat actually works. It just needs to look like a cat to pass the visual inspection. I want to install it right here. This is the page on Amazon. I chose this catalytic converter because the 2.5 inch diameter will fit over my exhaust pipe and it's small enough that it should fit under my car. Crackheads be saying, you cut out the wrong part, man. This pipe has two layers. I think the outer one is supposed to be kind of like a heat shield. It's 2.5 inch outside diameter here. I have the catalytic converter installed on the pipe. It's a little bit of a loose fit. I have this flange tightened. This catalytic converter is right where it was, but you see this gap here? And I can't get this flange against this piece of wood. The pipe needs to come down because it needs to be at more of an angle. I notice the end of this pipe is slightly smaller, and if I don't stick it in as far, I get a lot more adjustment. I'll trim some material off the cat, then I can adjust that angle. I did a few small welds to hold everything together. I don't want to fully weld the seams yet, in case I need to grind them off and redo it. Now the pipe is ready for a test fit in the car. The flanges bolt up perfectly, but the cat is too close to the body. I have to redo it. I flipped the new cat around and trimmed the end to move it closer to the back of the car. I'm doing a few welds again and hoping it will fit better this time. All right, test fit number two. The pipe bolts up perfectly and is still pretty close to the body, but the cat isn't any closer than the rest of the pipe. Now, one problem, there is no heat shield above that new cat, so I could start my carpet on fire, but I probably won't. If I have problems with performance, then I could just do what the boys in California do. Get my emissions done and then take this thing back out. I finished welding the pipe and I'm painting it with this high temp exhaust paint. It's a special ceramic based paint that can withstand 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm using a heat gun to help dry the paint. Normally you wouldn't do this with a spray paint, but this exhaust paint actually recommends baking it in the oven. If you put car parts in your oven, you shouldn't use it for pizzas after that, and your old lady might start tripping too. I have zero patience for paint, so I'm glad I can just dry it in a couple minutes like this. It will cure when the car is running and the exhaust gets hot. Here's that exhaust gasket again. The Felpro 23626. I've bought so many of these, I have the part number memorized. It's $4.29 plus tax at AutoZone. Install the pipe on the hanger first, then install the gasket at the back and get the nuts and bolts started. After that, install the front gasket and bolts. The Felpro gasket is a little big, so make sure it's lined up and doesn't hang down too far while you tighten the bolts. The gaskets will compress as you tighten the bolts. Carefully torque all four bolts with a torque wrench to 35 foot-pounds, or just zip them down with an electric impact. Make sure the flanges are even when you tighten the bolts so you don't get leaks. I went to the mission shop and said, I installed a second catalytic converter, I'm ready for the test. The guy took a look at my engine and said, it looks like Chuck E. Cheese in there. Then he looked under the car and said, you installed your catalytic converters wrong. They're usually not right next to each other like that. And I said, well, that's where it fits. They want two cats, I have two cats. So he said, Okay, so he took a camera, went under the car, took a picture of the catalytic converters, went in the car, made sure the check engine light is off, then took my gas cap, connected it to a machine that pressure tested it, and bam, I passed emissions. How cool is that? Now, normally these places will also renew your registration, but I let mine expire for a whole year. In Utah at the moment, they will renew your registration up to nine months expired, which is pretty generous, but you know, I'm 
disorganized and let it go for a year. So I had to go to the DMV. I brought this piece of paper saying I passed emissions along with my old registration, paid the state $91 this time and got new registration. So they give you a registration sticker to update your license plate. I put that on my license plate and now my car is once again, street legal. All right, video's over. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. But if you care to stick around a little bit longer, I have a bonus emission story for you. Now, the last time I went to this emissions shop, I didn't think I needed a second catalytic converter. The car has a new cylinder head, it runs great, and the one catalytic converter I have is also new. I told the guy, my car burns really clean, to which he replied, no, it doesn't. Can you smell your exhaust? And I said, well, yeah, it smells a little funky. He said, yes, it smells like it's burning rich. I said, yeah, you're right. Can we test it with the exhaust gas analyzer? And he said, no, we don't test OBD2 vehicles with the exhaust gas analyzer. So I said, pretty please, just for fun, can we test my car? And he said, yes, check it out. In cars 1995 and older, the exhaust gas analyzer is used to measure emissions. They do two tests, one at idle and another test at 2,500 RPM. The most important numbers are hydrocarbons, which is unburnt gas, and carbon monoxide, which is also a product of not burning the gas properly. I got my car tested at idle and at 2,500 RPM before I installed the second catalytic converter. Then I came back and got it tested with the new CAT installed. I compiled the numbers into a new page that is easier to read. Hydrocarbons are measured in parts per million and they want to see less than 220. My car got 271 at idle, so it would fail the test. CO2 emissions should be less than 1.2%. My car did okay at 0.654. Carbon dioxide and oxygen also come out of the exhaust pipe. If gasoline is burned perfectly, you would see zero hydrocarbons, zero carbon monoxide, and just CO2 plus water coming out of the exhaust pipe. The car was also tested with the engine running at 2500 RPM and the transmission in neutral. There's less load on the engine than at idle, so the RAV4 is doing better. 150 parts per million hydrocarbon and 0.4% carbon monoxide are both passing numbers. I drove my car two miles from my house to the emissions shop and tested it before everything was fully warmed up. If you drive on the highway first, the catalytic converter will work better and you'll have cleaner emissions for the test. I came back and tested the car with the second catalytic converter installed. Disclaimer, this is not a completely fair comparison because this time I drove on the highway first. Now I have 135 parts per million hydrocarbons, which is much better than before. Carbon monoxide is almost nothing. The 2500 RPM test shows hydrocarbons at 78 parts per million, which is actually very clean. Carbon monoxide was a bit higher, but well below the limit. Perhaps Toyota didn't just install a second cat for fun. This car needs it. Since this guy was being super nice to me and letting me play with the exhaust gas analyzer, I decided to ask for more. What are the emissions like on all my vehicles? Let's play a game. Before I show you the emissions results, I want you to rank my vehicles from cleanest emissions to dirtiest. You already know about the RAV4. For the comparison, I'll use the best numbers with two catalytic converters installed. My other car is a 2017 Hyundai Tucson. It has a 1.6 liter turbo engine with gasoline direct injection. It doesn't get good gas mileage, but the GDI has very precise control over how much fuel goes into the engine. I also have a 2022 Honda CRF 300L dirt bike. It's fuel injected and has a catalytic converter. It gets 85 miles per gallon and still has all the emissions components for a street legal motorcycle. Next is my 2010 Honda Elite 110 scooter. This one has fuel injection and a catalytic converter. It's an Atkinson cycle engine and it's very efficient getting 100 miles per gallon of gas. Now make your best guess about how these vehicles rank from best to worst. And here are the results, arranged by hydrocarbon emissions tested at 2500 RPM. The Tucson did the best, with only 31 parts per million. It's a newer car, and that GDI really does improve emissions. The Honda Dirt Bike comes in second, with 76 parts per million. 
The RAV4 is only slightly worse, although it's cheating a little here because I used the numbers after driving it on the highway and everything else only got 2 miles before the test. My super fuel efficient scooter is dead last. At 450 parts per million, this thing is a pollution monster. I was very surprised with these results. How does it get 100 miles per gallon if it's not burning the fuel correctly? Would it get even better gas mileage if the engine didn't send all the unburnt fuel into the exhaust pipe? Also, fun fact, they don't do emissions testing here on motorcycles and scooters. My next question is, which vehicle is best for the environment? The scooter has very high hydrocarbon emissions, but it also burns a lot less gas. If I ride the scooter 100 miles, I burn 1 gallon of gas. The RAV4 would burn 5 gallons to make the same trip. I'm going to focus on only the hydrocarbon emissions and multiply each vehicle's emissions by a factor based on how much less efficient it is than the scooter. The RAV4 burns 5 times more gas than the scooter, so I'll multiply its number by 5. The Hyundai burns 4.16 times more fuel than the scooter, and the motorcycle is pretty close with 1.17 times the fuel consumption of the scooter. After factoring in gas mileage, the Hyundai and the motorcycle switch places, and the scooter is still dead last, but kind of close to the RAV4. My conclusion is, a brand new motorcycle is best for the environment, and the newer car is pretty close. If your idea of a fun time is rolling coal, then the scooter and the RAV4 are what you want. In the United States, emissions testing is only done in highly populated counties where pollution is a problem. You live out in a country, you can pollute as much as you want. Leave a comment if emissions testing is required where you live, and let me know what problems you've had registering your RAV4. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.